really thrilled to introduce the Decarcerating Care Fireside Chat. I'll start with a quick introduction and visual description. I'm Jessie Roth. I'm the director of IDA. I am a white woman with dark brown hair with uh, side bangs, a big bun on my head. I'm wearing a red shirt and headphones, and I have a couple of houseplants behind me. And what I want to say at the start of this is, you know, in honor of Ida's five-year five anniversary, we really wanted to bring back some of the incredible activists and folks with lived experience and experience of all kinds to kind of talk about new and emerging themes on this topic of decarcerating care. And this format is meant to be really informal and we're gonna be talking about things that our speakers today are really passionate about and that build on some of the topics that we've talked about already in this series. So um, without further ado, I will introduce, or I'll have our, our panelists, our speakers today introduce themselves. And why don't we start in the order people are on my screen. So Jess, let's go with you first. All right. Um, I am Jess. I use she and her pronouns. Um, I'll start with a visual description. Um, I'm a fat white femme with short kind of pastel orange hair, although it looks kind of yellow on here, I guess. Um, I have a septum ring and big white glasses. My shirt says non-compliant on it. Um, I talk with my hands a lot and have tattoos on all my fingers that say stay soft um, and a tattoo of a heart that says dead on it um, on my hand. I have other ones, but those are the big visible ones. Um, for work, I um, work in suicidology and I'm interested in the intersections of lived experience, liberation, and mental health. Um, and I teach in a PsyD program and um, work on the Col on Colorado's crisis and peer support lines. Um, and personally, I identify as a mad person and specifically a voice hearer and suicidal person. And because of those experiences, um, I've experienced psychiatric incarceration and abuse, including seclusion restraint, uh, physical and chemical and sexual and physical violence. Um, so this is an important topic to me because of um, those personal experiences and, and those of my people. Thanks, Jess. Uh, Dustin, let's have you go next. What's up, this is Dustin. Um, I'm a light-skinned black man. Uh, I have a homestead grease cap on. Um, I have the airport behind me. Um, I have on a black mask that probably runs into my beard. Um, I use he him pronouns and uh, for work, I, I've been at People's Hub for about two years now, which is an online movement school. Um, and my role there has been to support on the ground organizers um, and thinking through ways that ableism influences the rise of the global far right, um, climate justice, uh, movement culture, as well as solidarity economy and attempting to provide like technical support as people implement strategies. Um, what feels important right now is I'm on the board of Straight Ahead, which is an organization birthed out of the Abolitionist Law Center, um, which is in the lineage of many of the political prisoners in Pennsylvania. Um, our title, the name comes from Russell Maroon Schultz. Um, and our, our goal is to end death by incarceration. Um, and also on the board of HERD, which is a organization that has been around for about 15 years that has worked to free deaf and disabled people um, and then support folks um, while they're out or while they're incarcerated along with family. And yeah, I'm excited to be in conversation with you all too. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, Nadia. Hi everyone, my name is Nadia Mbande and I use she, her pronouns. To give you a visual description, I'm a light-skinned black woman wearing a black turtleneck sweater. Uh, my black locks are styled in a ponytail and I'm sitting within the white walls of my bedroom. I identify as a mad queer mother, a budding scholar as an anthropology PhD student at NYU, a multimedia artist and a mental health doula. And I'm really excited for this conversation. And Stephanie. Hey everyone, this is Stephanie. I use they and she pronouns. I am a white, multiply disabled, queer and non-binary person wearing a green sweater, sitting in my bedroom on unseated Wampanoag and Narragansett land. And behind me, uh, there's a painting on the wall um, and some yellow shelves next to me. 
Um, and I'm showing up in this space um, as a psychiatric survivor. I've been um, in and out of the mental health system for um, a lot of a lot of years now. Um, I've been doing um, organizing and education in the roughly what we call the mental health world, disability worlds, and really trying to bridge um, some of the disability justice um, movement and foundations and have um, connections to um, MAD spaces and neurodivergent spaces. Um, I do facilitation work. I have a two-year-old um, and I'm also the founding director of Project Let's and we are um, committed to building radical peer support collectives, um, sharing um, survival and thriving skills in communities so that we can move through all of our experiences um, without cages, without force, um, with lots of care. Um, and yeah, really excited to be here with y'all. Great. Thanks, everyone, for introducing yourself. So for our first question here, which I'll also put in the chat for y'all, um, I think this builds off of a question that we really dug into in the, the second installment of Decarcerating Care, but there's always a lot more to say. So the question is, in the context of mental health crisis response specifically, what are the major differences between quote-unquote reformist reforms and steps taken toward actual abolition? What examples of each do you see unfolding in your community and in the wider world? And let's start with Dustin for this one, and then anyone else can feel free to jump in. Yeah, this is Dustin. Um, so I guess I can detail like some of the work that I've been engaged in um, for, I think, six or seven years now um, with one organization and how we transitioned from being a reformist organization to one that is abolitionist um, or attempting to be. And we started off as a group of disabled, um, disability-led formations, along with some racial justice groups in the wake of Anthony Hill being murdered in DeKalb County in Georgia. Um, Anthony was somebody that had diagnoses um, and was still killed by police. So one of our first things that we did was the attempt of like police training, right? So we went through like, what does it look like for them to be um, uh, taught by people with lived experience? Um, from that, we transitioned to the 911 response um, and what does it look like for the, not only the paramedics, but also like the people that are receiving calls through the 911 system. And if there's a way to divert that elsewhere. Um, and then we went to the police chiefs and the policy place um, to try to draft different legislation to get other groups as those people that are responding and to get other groups that are the people that are being diverted towards um, through the call response system. So I, I mentioned like all of those, we had like a bunch of other interventions that we attempted to do, but all of them failed, right? All of them failed because the system is literally set up to perpetuate this type of situation to continue to happen. Um, so that's something that it was a slow burn. It took us a long time to learn. And although some of the folks in the group might've been more radical, um, we were really attempting to move at a pace that was for everybody and br bring everybody along. So. I would say out of that, what I learned was the importance of political education because that became the cornerstone of how the group operates. And it moved us to an abolitionist place where now our work is solely about how do we build up the skills within community to be able to respond, but not only respond, what do we do when the police actually show up? Because that's the reality as well. Um, so we skill share around that. And we work with different groups to build like a disability conscious um, groups that are already doing abolitionist work around policing, them to build a disability conscious, and then also to skill share with us in disability communities um, on political education. Um, and yeah, I don't have like these mass success stories out of it, but I can say that like we've been on the ground training folks and getting trained by folks for the last maybe uh, two years around that after we transitioned to being abolitionist. Um, and that group is called Us Protecting Us, and it operates mostly in Atlanta, Georgia. I, I love hearing like real examples of what um, what's happening in communities because there's so many different things. Um, it can be really hard to know when, uh, like, I think without a really good 
sort of structure to look through. It's hard to know when something is um, an abolitionist step or it's a reformist reform that that actually like um, helps the system stay in place. Like I think I've experienced lots of times where we thought we were doing something abolitionist and ended up not being so or not being able to um, to be the way that that we wanted it to be. So some of the things I think about is like, um, there's sort of these questions I think about to ask about whether something is reformist or abolitionist. And so does it like reduce funding for involuntary interventions? That's um, usually gonna be abolitionist usually. Um, is it reducing funding for law enforcement first responses um, or the connection between law enforcement and mental health? Is it challenging the idea that involuntary interventions increase safety? Um, is it reducing the um, coercive tools, tactics, and technology that mental health um, uses? Um, one of the things that's really on my mind related to that right now is that the new 988 system, they want to use geolocation services. Um, there's no reason that you need geolocation if you're going to use consent. Um, so it, it's always already not consensual when you're using geolocation. Um, it doesn't reduce the scale of involuntary treatment that's happening. Um, and so I, a lot of the reformist reforms that I've seen are, you know, the movement about like more beds or um, assertive outpatient treatment, like, oh, we're not doing involuntary inpatient treatment. So assertive outpatient treatment is better. And also assertive outpatient, like that term sort of obscures. Yeah, Steph, did you want to jump in? Thanks, Jess. Yeah, this yeah. is Steph. Yeah, I just wanted to say with that, I think, you know, we can often get like caught in this place where it's like okay don't touch it at all like don't touch the system at all because it's bad and like mm -hmm. build on the outside and that leaves behind everyone who's you know still currently trapped like a lot of mm -hmm. people you know don't recognize um you know on, on one spectrum that you know it's it can happen like this that you can be forced into ect electroconvulsive therapy mm -hmm. um you know people don't know anything about these not really fully really legal psychiatric court like kangaroo court systems that happen like there are a lot of places for intervention that mm -hmm. could reduce significant harm that aren't just focusing on increasing access to the system because that's where it stops for so many people and there are real things to consider about access but when we are just kind of vaguely talking about that's the solution, increasing access. Um, I think that's where a lot of those kind of gaps fall into place as well. If you're just supporting things that are only reinforcing like a biomedical model and understanding um, of what we've come to call mental illness. Yeah. And I think some of the things people are really excited about right now, like social workers instead of cops and things like that, is, it's like not actually abolitionist steps if the social workers right holds, like, cause that's not abolition. And so it's, that's complicated because um, like we we want people to be able to access the things they want, but also to be able to say no to things. Um, and maybe we only want specific kinds of treatment or many people do because they've never heard of any other alternative because that biomedical model is so dominating. So to me, like the abolitionist steps are, um, are about like addressing these things and reducing some of the harm of these things. And divesting from law enforcement and using peer support first responses instead of law, law enforcement first responses or community-based response and then eliminating things like imminent risk and mandatory reporting rules. Um, that, that's where abolition is in this space. Yeah, I appreciate so much of what you all shared there. And in particular, Jess, I really appreciate you like calling back in that, you know, let's replace cops with social workers thing, which really was some of the founding impetus for this talk series in the first place last summer after all the uprisings and George Floyd's murder everyone was like oh you know we'll defund the police we'll put all that money into mental health care like that was going to solve a problem and not just create new ones right and and I think what you're all speaking to is also about something else that we're really trying to do here is bridge movements and bridge conversations, because if these conversations are just happening in a silo of the radical mental health space or just in the prison abolition space, we're not going to, um, you know, make true progress. So, um, yeah, thanks all for your reflections there. And the next question that I want to ask um, is, and it's for Nadia and Stephanie and anyone else who wants to jump in on this one, but how do you see car carceral logic showing up in the context of parenting and childcare? 
how can we respond to the mental health needs of pregnant people and parents in ways that are not punitive and do not separate parents and children? I can jump in. This is Nadia. Um, this is a big one for me because um, like Stephanie, I also have a two-year-old. And so my experience of birth and postpartum is still pretty close in memory and uh, like somatic experience. And um, this is something that uh, starts with like preconception even. When I was um, diagnosed uh, with bipolar disorder, which is what um, I've been living with uh, for the past almost decade, my first thought is that I was going to be a terrible mom. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And I don't know who told an 18 year old this, probably no one, but there was already so much societal messaging and stigma around motherhood and mental illness that this was the first um, thing that came to my mind. And throughout receiving mental health services and psychiatry, no one talked about my mental health in relationship to uh, my reproductive health. And so when I eventually did become pregnant and wanted decided I wanted to become a mother, all of these fears started coming back. and. There, um, there really isn't a lot of care around decisions um, what, about choosing to take psychiatric medication or not taking psychiatric medication. There's a lot of, um, the, the legacy of eugenics is still very present. And as a disabled um, or mad uh, pregnant person, you are you know, already being given all these messages that you are not enough. You cannot take care of your child. You will be a harm and a danger to your child. You do not have the skill set. And um, that is something that I battled with throughout my pregnancy while also not getting the psychiatric care that I needed and, and ending up being um, incarcerated for three days while pregnant and having a lot of other um, crises because I wasn't, um, I wasn't seen as like a valid human who could take care of another human. And so I think it just, it starts with uh, the, our ideas about what motherhood looks like and also um, embracing this uh, kind of collective idea of cope, er everyone being involved in the process of parenting and the parent parenting journey. And that just brings me, I mean, I'm glad I got to a place in my postpartum period where I did find the care to regain stability, um, to deal with, you know, mania, suicidal depression and all those things, um, to be able to take on the challenges of keeping a newborn alive. But what I would love to see is care in that space that does not separate parents from their children. So if a parent is unwell, they are given the support, whether it's medication, therapy, psychiatry, a retreat away, that does not separate them from their child because that's going to add trauma and is not gonna help the situation and will cause more mental health problems for the parent and the child. So that's that's one thing. And then I, I really wanna see the decriminalization of mental um, illness, especially in the postpartum period, if there is any harm that does come to the child, um, I would like for us to um, not not really respond to these sensational news stories about, you know, a mother killing her child or things like that, but really understanding what is going on behind the scenes and, and the, the lack of care that is there um, and how we can support um, a person who has had that kind of traumatic experience and, instead of um, criminalize them and punish them. Um, so yeah, Stephanie, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, yeah, I have so many thoughts, but even where you just ended, you know, I think the it's such a hard balance because you have there often is so much more like societal empathy for I'm thinking about, you know, non disabled parents who end up murdering their disabled children, right? I was actually in a I think a training with you, Dustin, where I um, heard of Tracy Latimer for the first time. And Tracy Latimer's story being just, you know, being a disabled child who was murdered um, by her father. And immediately, like, the the story was just one of, like, understanding and compassion. And of course, this was the outcome. Um, you know, Tracy was so disabled and had a terrible quality of life. And, like, the, the ways in which we are able to pick and choose, like, where the narrative goes and when and who we stick it to and who we humanize shows me that we are very capable of abolition, that we're actually very capable of extending um, the compassion that's required to do what we're trying to do when we actually find that person to be of value and to be 
um, a human um, that's worthy. And yeah, so Nadia talked about these legacies of eugenics that are ever present, right? You know, we have a Supreme Court case that legalized the widespread sterilization of, you know, who we label to be disabled, mentally ill, that's never been overturned, right? We have um, that ongoing narrative, look at Autism Speaks, right? This huge organization um, that's, you know, a eugenicist hate group that has financially invested and personally invested in building up this fear-based narrative that autism is the worst tragedy that could ever happen, right? So we have like a lot of, a lot of different um, you know, thoughts and places for me. And I, I think, you know, I'm thinking of a lot of things. I'm thinking of like um, in, in with parenting, with like mad parents, neurodivergent parents, disabled parents, like, do we actually have space to be honest? Like, do we actually have space to be honest about what's happening for us? I was teaching a class on birth and disability um, and crisis response. And we were talking about intrusive thoughts and I literally, as a facilitator, like broke down in this training because I had personally never had the space to talk about, um, you know, what had happened maybe when I'm giving my, my daughter a bath and I'm like, oh my God, like having thoughts about, you know, whatever, I'm um, doing whatever type of harm and being like, I'm a horrific parent. Am I going to do these things? Can't tell anyone. I already have a diagnosed history of, you know, mental illness, right? Like you're constantly navigating, like, who can I tell the truth to? And also like, is there a way back? Because for me, I don't know how we're talking about anything about like even like restorative justice without like a way back. So if I come to you in my worst moment where I am actually maybe not able to be a parent in that moment where I really actually can't take care of my child, like, does that permeate to the future? Like, are you a, like, can I come back and like be a parent who is able to show up in a different moment? And I have like very few people in my life where I can like move in and out of that with and that doesn't like permanently change the way that they perceive me to be able to take care of my child or not um and yeah i think you know i i've seen people who are incarcerated for like getting care as a parent uh, maybe their medication um they have side effects and they're like well i need help and they reach out and their kids are taken away these are primarily black and indigenous people poor people um and then if you don't get care that can be wrong um, and yeah, the last thing I'll say is I think like we all have work to do to unlearn, like I have seen how I've internalized the practices and principles of psychiatry and how I'm parenting and how I've been taught to give care. Um, and also that like carceral logics don't just happen in isolation. Like we are often forced into um, like being part of that because of the like oppressive and traumatizing conditions that we're in which is why it's not just so easy to say, okay, let me just like not yell at my kid. There's often like a million other things happening that create that condition for that moment. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you both so much for that. I, I think that this conversation at the intersection of carcerality and parenting and childcare is really important. And personally, I haven't seen it happening that many places. So I'm just really grateful for the work that you're both doing to kind of bring more visibility to that and to, to weave it together with what we're talking about here today. I think that it connects back to what I was talking about, about um, thinking about safety differently, being a core component of abolition is like the way we've structured what we call safety for people, for especially for children is about like keeping the things that we've deemed dangerous away from people. And so like, if you are part of an identity that's marginalized and you're probably considered dangerous. And so there's always going to be something um, trying to, to take that, that child away from you. And so um, I think our whole system around that is built around this idea of safety that's not real. Thanks for adding that, Jess, super important point. Um, so another, another theme that kind of came up as of interest today is kind of, talking about the Free Britney movement as it relates to this decarcerating care discussion. And on a personal note, I just wanna say, as somebody who has an older sister who lives under a guardianship, I've been watching that story unfold, really hoping, as I imagine everyone here has as well, that the momentum from this will continue. Like we had a really visible case of one of the most famous people in the world who was living under a conservatorship and no one could understand how that could happen in the United States. And again, I'm sure all of y'all on this call are 
well acquainted with the fact that this happens all the time. And in fact, most of the people who um, are subject to this form of basically state sanctioned abuse are mad and disabled and neurodivergent folks. And so this question for anyone who wants to come in is just how do you see these themes of decarcerating care as related to Free Britney? And how do you think we can keep the momentum going um, to help free the mad disabled and neurodivergent folks who are trapped in similar abusive situations? So whoever wants to come in, please feel free. Yeah, this is Stephanie. Um, just I'll just quickly say that, you know, I think that um, there were a lot of difficult conversations happening and taking place, even for people who were supporting um, Brittany, you know, there, this kind of narrative kept forming that was like, well, this isn't right because Brittany's not actually disabled. She's a mother. She works. Oh my God, she works so much. She pays all these people. Um, she can communicate like effectively about her abuse. Um, and therefore this isn't right. And I think, you know, that is a, a real place of tension where, um, what we're actually saying is this, this is okay. Um, if you're disabled, if you're really disabled, if you're really mentally ill, um, but we just, you know, we caught the wrong fish basically, but the system itself is okay. We just got the wrong person. So um, I think, you know, understanding that something like this can only happen under law if you are considered to be disabled, which means that you are considered to be incompetent, lacking insight, no longer deserving of personhood. Um, and these things should be happening to those other crazy people over there. Um, and that, you know, I'll, I'll pass it off here and just saying that there are other ways to actually um, participate in supported decision making um, and ways that offer resources and care to people who need support. We're not saying like nobody needs help or care or is deserving of that, but that under these conditions that that is quite literally not possible. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it over to um, Dustin. Yeah, so like, I'm thinking about this this conversation uh, and it feels very much just like a conversation. Um, I haven't been exposed to like people necessarily organizing around guardianship, like new formations, more so it's like the same people that have been doing that. And those people have typically been disabled folks. And I think that speaks volumes to who is actually like targeted by this, um, just as like Jesse lifted. Um, and the way I've seen this like play out on the ground is in like situations of thinking about deinstitutionalization, de I think earlier we had a conversation about what is abolition is what is not. I think there should be more debate and study and discussion around whether or not deinstitutionalization was abolitionist. Um, I think it's important. I think there's absolutely things that are like, fuck yeah, this is abolitionist because you literally closed this fucking warehouse, right? Not all of them are closed, say that, but you literally closed some of these and got people out. But I'm thinking 40, 50 years later, like one of them is like assisted living centers. Some of these places where if we're thinking about abolition, it's not just for the sake of it, right? Like we want to be abolitionists because we want to erode the possibility of the system and those logics to pop up in any formation, right? Like don't format. And that's like what we're concerned about, whether or not like we call it abolition or not. And some of like, I think the failure of the deinstitutionalization movement was to offer those thousands of things that we need to actually support ourselves when we're not being warehoused. Um, and some of what manifested were like these assisted living centers or group homes where they take on a different name depending on the state. The infrastructure built around them is so minute that there's like almost no supervision and there's almost no way to intervene unless you like personally know somebody there, right? And I've been in like, I've been in some of the facilities where it's literally just like everybody there, this is their housing. It is geographically dislocated from, I was in Pittsburgh. So one was in like a spot called McKeesport, which was across a river and a bridge there. The one in Pittsburgh crosses the river bridge. Dustin may have run out of airport Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say if somebody else wants to jump in on this while we see if we can get Dustin back, feel free. Yeah, I was just really thinking about um, the carceral nature of reproductive care for med neurodivergent and disabled folks as well. Um, I was really struck by the Free Britney movement because of the way that it did highlight the way that you know her guardian was 
um, taking control of her reproductive cycle. And I think that's something that is still very much present as we've just kind of touched on with eugenics, but it, it hasn't been exposed in such a public way. And um, I just, I wanna highlight how reproductive care and mental health really intersect. And, you know, thinking about the, where we're at um, in this country with abortion rights as well, abortion is also a mental health issue. There are people who need abortion so that they can take care of their mental health because of, you know, not being able to be on certain medications and be pregnant at the same time or, you know, poverty. There's just so many, um, there are so many uh, issues that intersect uh, with, with reproduction. Um, I, I, I don't know the, the research on this as well, but also uh, stigma when it comes to applying for adoption and things like that. Um, the way that uh, people with psychiatric disabilities are uh, discriminated and they do not have the rights to become parents. So that's something that I think the guardianship really highlighted. And I don't really know what we're going to do about this, but I think it's something we need to start mobilizing around. Hey, this is Dustin, just checking to see if it's cool if I jump back in. Okay, so Stephanie, thank you for letting me know where I left off to. Um, yeah, like if you don't know somebody in some of these institutions, and I call them institutions intentionally, um, even though they don't look like these traditional warehouses, because because of the way in which like people are are incarcerated there. And I, and I don't use that term lightly either. I'm thinking about just like the level of surveillance, the level of purported security. Um, and it often goes hand in hand with like the guardianship um, situation. So I think that there's like opportunity for corporations to literally exploit dozens of people at the same time while they're controlling their finances, while they're controlling their movement. Um, and it is, similar and aching like there's many similarities to what an occupation looks like um, when you look at like some of those institutions and how they operate um, so the carceral logic part of it is like of course this looks like an occupation in Palestine that is in McKeesport Pennsylvania that is situated 50 miles from a prison as across the street from a prison in Pennsylvania Somerset and Lower Highlands right um, but I say all of that to say like I'm I'm thinking about like a way out of this and like what we do to organize. And one is to like completely change the language around conservatorship. I think that it offers us something that is like not actually possible to build on or really accurate. Like it's the language of the system saying that it is there to care for people, right? And it doesn't provide that. And we should just be clear about that and say that it's a mechanism of control. And the people that are targeted are almost always poor people and they're disabled people because there's rich people under conservatorships all the time or people that have access to the money, but they can't access it because they're disabled. Um, so I think we should be more clear and accurate when we talk about what it is. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna stop there because I see the timekeeper pop up. Thanks everyone for all of those reflections and something I'll just add briefly. And I think it, it builds on what you just said, Dustin, about like accuracy of like language, if we're gonna change anything, is I think a lot about how, you know, a guardianship, a conservatorship, they use this language of like the least restrictive situation possible, which I always found, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but just they're always incredibly restrictive. What does that even mean? It's kind of just like language that they put in there that makes it sound like this isn't going to be abusive and, and it almost always is. Um, so I appreciate what it what you said there and Stephanie also for, for uplifting alternatives like supportive decision-making which other countries outside the US have used for decades and like it works. There's research that shows that it works. Like why aren't we really prioritizing that here? Um, and yes, Dustin, if you have anything to add, please jump in. Yeah, and thank you. Um, I wanted to add on to that language and say, like, I think one of the actions is to really look at some of the tenets that people think that conservatorship is like good for, and like really think about what that means to like share those skills with each other. Like the work of Cent Centers for Independent Living has been doing those type of uh, independent living skills forever. Um, and it's like, we can take parts of the guardianship that actually works, right? Like we don't have to just say that everything about it is trash because some people have good experiences. So taking that and applying it to how we build our own skills and community is important. Yeah, that's a super important point. I think that goes for kind of reimagining all of these systems. 
um, not assuming that everything is, is flawed and starting with what works. Um, so for our next question here, I, um, I think this is moving in the direction of kind of some practical or pragmatic advice for people who work in care settings. And that could mean a lot of things. That could mean you're a clinical social worker or you are a peer supporter, peer specialist, or you're just doing care work in your community or you're a doula or any number of things. And so the question is, how can we interrupt carceral logic and punitive responses when providing care? How do we hold health justice principles when people are engaging in ways that activate us? And if you'd also like to add um, how training for mental health professionals um, can integrate these, these values in practical ways. And uh, Jess, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, this is something I spend so much time thinking about in the kind of work that I'm in because um, it's, it's really actually challenging to hold health justice principles and like enact them. Um, like starting with this idea that everyone is worthy of care. And so what does it mean to do, to practice in a way, um, like to practice this work in a way where everyone is deserving of care when they're, when the person that you're interacting with is explicitly attacking you or your people. Um, and, and that's something in, a, in crisis work that happens a lot. Um, and um, like figuring out how to to hold that space or to make that true of your service, maybe, even if it's not true for each individual providing it is really complicated. Um, so, you know, our, our call center, when community crises happen, people who, um, especially things that are very politically fraught, people who are on either side of, um, of whatever the issue is are, are all going to call us and, and they can be pretty um difficult to hold space for and then they can be really hateful sometimes like people when they're scared are very hateful and people who are in crisis and are hateful also need support and so just figuring that out is complicated I don't have answers about this because I don't want people to be harmed by providing care work either and there's some kind of knowledge that we go into this work with that we might be working with people who who are different from us and so yeah, and finding ways to hold all of that, especially within like nonprofit industrial complexes, if that's where you're doing that work, is just, um, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, this is stuff. Yeah, I think, you know, just quickly, I think the, the baseline of where we're at, like, in, from my perspective with providers is that like, you're complicit, like, there's no way out of it. And I think too many providers are like, looking for the, the thing that absolves them that like makes it all okay. And like, I can't give it to you. I don't think anyone can give it to you. Like I have people all the time being like, oh, like what if I, I could only get a job in a place that does ABA? And I'm like, I don't know, like don't work there or do. And like, understand like, like what, what that looks like and be willing to take accountability for like the agent and like the way that we, you know, that you are perpetuating harm because I believe that we're all complicit in harm to various degrees and we have to take accountability and responsibility for that but I don't see that happening with with the mental health system at all with providers at all um it's actually like quite disturbing the ways that certain ideologies are perpetuated even on like a basic level of like therapy is supposed to be like a container to say whatever you want and then we have like mental health providers online being like oh my God, my patient is trauma dumping. Like, what is that? Like, that is not literally possible under those conditions. So I think, um, you know, we have like therapeutic tools, just like CB, um, um, like therapeutic tools that are centered on like change your thoughts, like that will change your behavior, change your life. Um, that doesn't work for marginalized people and people who are oppressed, who are asked, um, you know, to just change the way you're thinking about your oppression and suddenly it's all fine. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, for me, I, I want to see, um, people who like, at what point do you say no? Like, I won't make this call. I'm not going to bring this person to the hospital. I'm not going to call the police. I want to see more people actually being willing to lose their license because that's a, actually a sign to me, like not always, but in certain, in certain ways, um, you know, that, that you have done something to subvert the power of the system, um, you know, when, when we actually need that to happen. So, um, yeah, I, I just want to see more 
um, realistic conversations happening. Um, because I think too many people went into this field because they feel bad. They feel pity for people. They want to fix people. Um, and they have no real skills outside of wellness and this like very vague concept of like mental health. Like people often have no idea actually to how to support someone who's suicidal or having like experiencing altered states. It's just like a hospital. Um, so yeah, that's just a couple of, of thoughts. And I don't know if you have any thoughts, Nadia. Yeah, you've made me think about a lot. This is, this is Nadia. Um, what you just said made me think about um, people who do care work, who are disabled, mad, neurodivergent, and what supports are there for those people to do the work? Because I've encountered very few people but they do exist who do have some kind of psychiatric disability and they're a psychiatrist or they're like a nurse working in a psychiatric facility. And I think that's so incredibly powerful because we know the power of lived experience and the, all the skill sets that come with just simply surviving as a, as a mad disabled neuro neurodivergent person. But then there's that fear because the stigma is so strong that the care person is supposed to be someone who is able-bodied, able-minded, you know, have everything together and they're there for, you know, people who, who aren't. And that, that really isn't the way society works and the thing is working. Um, but that just makes those people uh, who have, you know, mental health issues like me, very vulnerable when they're working um, in the space of, of care work or doula work or peer support. Um, whatever have you. And I, I don't really have any solutions around this um, because I am someone who kind of lives with my lived experience on my sleeve and is very open about it and think it, it adds and, you know, is a strength and all those things. But especially since becoming a mother, I've become increasingly aware of how that can be a liability in some cases and how I am vulnerable and can be harmed and are my options limited in the work that I want to do, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any solutions, but this is just what this question has brought up for me. Yeah, this is Dustin. And I think this is like one of the, uh, one of the areas that illuminates like what providing access looks like under capitalism um, and how it's really impossible. Like the position of the worker as somebody that is required to, you know, accumulate this amount of capital in order to fucking survive like you have to you have to constantly like be at odds with like what your principles are your values are as a person um and sometimes being forced to like endure abusive uh situations that's been like the story of oppressed people for a very long time right so this is like nothing new but i think like a solidarity economy approach to care work is like something to really explore as movements and start to like move towards this is not just like something that can be unionized out right care workers have been unionized for a long time those protections still aren't there but what the solidarity economy does is like it's not just about collective ownership but it's collective ownership along with these principles that we are all in struggle around like solidarity and diversity and inclusion um and not like the dei bullshit right like something that is like actually like uh about creating community and i think about so much of like the the work of access it's been commodified and it actually doesn't have to be. Like a lot of the care work that's performed is performed unpaid and unacknowledged. And so it's not an industry, right? Like it's not a formalized industry as, the, as we look at it. Um, but there are ways in which like barter systems are set up there. There are ways in which that care work is acknowledged and it is not paid financially but it is paid through other things because other people are doing shit to make a household run or a community run so i think that this is like a huge area that like we'll continue to come back to as long as like we're participating in capitalism in the same way and not attempting to move towards collective ownership and care work that is not commodified but more so as a necessity as to like how we engage with community Yeah, I think capitalism is always sort of this like undercurrent in, in all of this stuff is that it, it drives um, so much of the decision making that's, that's really harmful to people. One of the things I get very concerned about and that I see a lot within those sort of, whether it's a traditional mental health treatment structure and also within peer support spaces 
is that when we feel harmed by people we're providing care for, our automatic response is because like carceral logics are so ingrained in us, we're so used to um, living in that way, our responses are often like punitive and, um, and replicate carceral systems. And, and so there's this piece of like doing care work for me that's about like, how do we figure out how to move away from that? Um, and, and it's so, I think it's something that's really hard to teach and you have to, you have to care about doing that, right? You have to believe in, um, believe in something specific to do that. And so what a lot of what I will see is like these spaces that are supposed to be alternatives or supposed to be um, more liberatory spaces enacting the same kind of punishment mentality. It's like, okay, so you interacted incorrectly with me and now you don't get to get care anymore. Um, or I'm going to hang up on you or I'm going to like all, so all these things show up even within our alternative spaces sometimes. Yeah. Thanks everyone for, for feeding in on that one. And there were a lot of really important themes there. I think something that Nadia touched on in terms of the importance of having providers who have lived experience is really important. Um, and it, you know, is something that I know not everyone is safe or in a situation where they can do that, but the more that the systems around them can make people feel safe and empowered to, to really tell their story and stand in their power in that way. And then just this overarching theme of power and how clinicians need to be able to give that up. And that should be part of the accountability for anyone who's doing this work and, and looking at like, what is the intention that someone's coming to this work in the first place? If you're coming, cause you're here, I think it was Stephanie who said like to fix people or to diagnose people, you're, you're coming, you know, at the beginning with a holding power over people. And that needs to be undone if you're going to um, provide liberatory support for anybody. And so at this point, I think we're going to move towards our, our closing question. And I would love to hear from everyone on this one. It's a little bit of a kind of strategy focus, like what can we do now type of question. And it is what world building uh, strategies can we use to do more than just moving away from carceral approaches, which we've talked about a lot, but towards liberation. So what is a concrete step that everyone can take today to transform harm in our communities, transform this mental health system, while recognizing that we lack a lot of the resources and the infrastructure that we need to do it. So um, I think Stephanie, maybe we'll start with you and then everyone, um, if you can keep your responses a little brief so we can hear from everyone, but that'd be great, thanks. Yes, um, yeah, for me, I think a lot of what I see like that moves towards carcerality in the sphere of what we're talking about comes out of this like weaponization of the self and the individual that has, you know, very, very long histories that I won't, you know, get into right now. But, um, you know, this idea that um, this shows up in a lot of ways, but one of which being in our society, like we continually reinforce this idea that people aren't like really deserving of care until they're like at the point of like deep crisis. And we have this like scarcity mindset that's like, oh, like, I only have like this limited energy. And if I love someone, I can't like provide them all this care. Now I've got to like wait until it's like a real, real crisis. And then what happens is like people are dead, right? Because people die and people don't get the care that we need. And we don't actually show up the ways that we can show up, um, you know, while people are still here, while people are still alive. And I think about for me, I had a suicide attempt in April of this year, maybe, I don't even remember. And like the way that certain people showed up for me after that, like you can understand why, like we have this cycle of like, okay, like this really bad thing happens. Now all these people show up, they provide this love, they provide this care. And then like two weeks later, like, boom, everyone was gone. No one remembered. I'm still in the same conditions, except now I'm like alive <laughs> and having to process all of that. So, you know, I think, um, we need to like find ways to tap out without abandoning people um, and also find ways to push and prioritize our community. Because if someone calls me at 3 a.m., like I'm going to get up, like I'm going to say, OK, I can't do this other thing because someone's in crisis and needs me. I'm not going to say, oh, I've got a work meeting at 9 a.m. I can't help you. Right. We've got to shift our priorities around in the ways that we can, because not everybody has access to um, the same choices. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I want to add there. Like, this is Dustin. Um, Stephanie, as you were saying that, like, I think about, like, I've, like, really mourned the younger version of myself. Like, I think about, I, I carry with me, like, this level of rage for what was done to me under the guise of it being care. Um, 
And it's just like a really fucked up thing to think about the conflation of like a punishment and treatment and care and control. And knowing that like so much of what we're attempting to do feels very impossible because we are responding to situations that are not created by self, right? Like we tell people don't fix the person and then we attempt to find a way to fix the person. Like, and that's like a recreation of like the, the medical logic. Um, and I think we have to be like really real about that, that what we're doing is impossible because it is continuously being created by all of this other shit. So I think the concrete step going forward is like a real move of solidarity. And I'm specifically thinking about cross movement organizing because there are movements that organize around shit that if they were to be eradicated, then most of the issues that we deal with will not be exacerbated anymore. It's not to say it's all gone, but I think we're at such a place that it's so hard to respond to the individual crises. So my concrete step is literally for people to like be there. Like that's like where we start at is people to be there. And also, um, and I'm just saying like for the people that are in your life, right? Like that is a stop gap until we can do something else. And another one is like really thinking about the popular education methodology being like powerful for me in this situation to talk to people in our own lives about the experiences that we've had of our aunts disappearing to institutions or our mothers being gone for a week um, or our cousins going to get locked, like whatever those situations were and having like very real conversations about them. Um, and attempts at vulnerability, I guess, um, to, to really understand like how it actually impacts us, because I don't think folks do. And I know a lot of people like myself, like don't want to like continuously like relive that trauma in public to tell people those experiences. This is Nadia. Um, this question, there's two main things I'm thinking back to uh, Jess's point about safety, and I'm really thinking like safety for who and safety from who, um, I would really love for us to, to figure out why we have this reaction and the justification for it being safety. Like, can we untangle that and see what that's really about at the end of the day um, when it comes to our fears for other people's safety and what is that triggering in ourself and it may have nothing to do with the other person or the other circumstance that you'll probably be causing harm by intervening and making assumptions. So that's one thing I'm thinking about. And then the other thing that it seems so obvious, but based on um, especially uh, Stephanie's response, why don't we just focus on the people who are actually here? And, and I say that in the, when, I, when it comes to like, when it comes to crisis, uh, response for people in my life I know there's a huge fear around when it's like I could die I could be dead I will kill, I might kill myself like people are moving based like on the impetus that I will no longer be here but why not focus on like me being here and what's going on with me while I'm still here and I think about this like with my friends um, not intervening in like the early stages of, of my personality changing or things happening with mania um, which kind of goes off course and you can't really help yourself when it's in a really acute stage, but when it's like really early, the person has enough like self-awareness and agency to be able to do something about it. But that's when my friends were like, oh, uh, I didn't think it was a crisis. Um, and I think that's, we really need to kind of like shift the focus off of the crisis moment and like what is leading up to the moment and, and how can we manage and make, make things not escalate in that way. And then I think about this back to the whole like reproductive thing, because that's just my jam. Uh, why don't we focus on the humans who are here, on, on the parents who are here? Because um, all, all of the care and safety around the unborn child is completely neglecting the fact that you have a pregnant person in front of you who has a life that needs to be preserved to the highest level and quality. And if we're focusing on that person standing in front of us, maybe that person will be more resourced to care for this person that is to be. Um, in the future. So those are my two ideas. Oh, I think that there's a starting off place of like um, building sort of solidarity networks um, that don't have to be based entirely on friendship um, where we all have ideas about what we can offer and what our limits are. 
um, so that we like know who to go to um, when things happen. Cause like, that's part of the reason we use systems is because it makes us clear about who to go to um, when something is, is not feeling right or, um, or when we think, think we need something. So if we can develop those networks um, on our own um, and ideally if they don't have to be based on friendship, I think that's helpful. But um, you know, sometimes it's easier when they're based on friendship at first and then over time, not so much. Um, so this like building networks, kind of understanding what it is that I need, what it is that I can contribute, what are limitations on contributing, and then how do we communicate those things as they change over time with each other? Because they do change over time and they are, they are allowed to. Um, and, um, and then also I think moving away from any kind of, um, any kind of process that's about like restricting or stopping something from happening. If we shift our perspective away from um, trying to contain things um, and more toward like helping people get the things that they need in the moment, um, we can have really different conversations instead of just focusing on um, like stopping potential like risks or um, bad things from happening. Yeah, this is stuff just super quick based on what Nadia and Jess were just saying. I think, you know, people want to like give you like the mental health first aid, one, two, three, four, do this. If they respond, yes, call the police if they don't do this. And like, that's not real. That's not how life works. There's like a spectrum of intervention. And I think that like we have, you know, we lack a lot of skills on knowing how and when to intervene with love and care, because if the goal is to just, okay, let's you know, intervene and go out and do all these things and the person doesn't respond the way you want, like, then what do you do? Are you just going to reinforce force and the same dynamics? Or do you actually have skills to sit with somebody who is not acting or behaving um, in the way that you want? So um, yeah, I think just actually weighing, like, is it better for me to intervene or should I not intervene because my actions are going to make um, things actually less safe? And who else can I bring into this situation who's better equipped and more grounded and skilled um, to handle the particular dynamics that might be present. Yes, to all of that. Thanks, everyone. And I think something I'm reflecting on too, listening to all of your shares, is just when it comes to world building and reimagining, like what are the alternatives? Like they exist. It's not like, oh my God, if we, you know, undo this one system or, you know, transform the system, what, what are we going to have instead? There are organizations, collectives, mostly led by, you know, people of color, indigenous folks, queer folks, um, disabled folks who have been building these alternatives for a long time and they need our support. So one concrete thing people can do if they don't know about, you know, organizations like People's Hub or Project Let's and groups like that a lot of y'all are representing that are building alternative systems, like to educate yourselves about the work that everybody's doing and, and support those as well. Um, and I think just to question everything, something I've been reflecting on personally is, is like how this carceral logic is genuinely embedded in, in everything. Um, and that comes with like un, unlearning at pretty much every turn, whether you're a mental health professional or no matter what, just a person, a human in the world. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to bring us to a close. And I just want to thank you all so much for all of the work that you do and all the insights that you shared today. And um, yeah, thanks for being part of this fireside chat with Ida and, and for the incredible work y'all do. We'll drop links in the description of this video where you can stay in touch with everybody's work. Thanks everyone.